Hey, man. Wait a minute. What's up with that music? Cut that music off. Man, put that, put that other one on. Oh, my bad, bro. Yeah. There we go. That's better. Let's start the video over, man. What's wrong with you? ODD TV. For years, Bill Gates has been the spokesman for worldwide pandemics and mass vaccination campaigns. He has gone on record many times saying that the world was not ready for the next pandemic. We're not ready for the next epidemic. We're not ready for a serious epidemic, an epidemic that would be more infectious and would spread faster than Ebola did. In October 2019, just a couple months before the arrival of COVID-19, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, in cooperation with the John Hopkins Center for Health Security and the World Economics Forum, hosted Event 201, a three and a half hour tabletop exercise that simulated a series of dramatic scenarios relating to a hypothetical pandemic. Strangely enough, this exercise was about a novel coronavirus that would kill millions. Nearly eight weeks after the simulation, an outbreak of a novel coronavirus turned into a reality in China. At least, that's what we're told. This led some media outlets to putting out stories about how the exercise actually predicted the spread of COVID-19. In response to these stories, an official statement was published on the Event 201 website. In October 2019, the John Hopkins Center for Health Security hosted a pandemic tabletop exercise called Event 201 with partners the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Recently, the Center for Health Security has received questions about whether that pandemic exercise predicted the current novel coronavirus outbreak in China. To be clear, the Center for Health Security and partners did not make a prediction during our tabletop exercise. For the scenario, we modeled a fictional coronavirus pandemic, but we explicitly stated that it was not a prediction. Instead, the exercise served to highlight preparedness and response challenges that would likely arise in a very severe pandemic. We are not now predicting that the novel coronavirus 2019 outbreak will kill 65 million people. Although our tabletop exercise included a mock novel coronavirus, the inputs we used for modeling the potential impact of that fictional virus are not similar to the novel coronavirus 2019. On March 13th, about a day after the world began locking down due to the virus, Bill Gates stepped down from the public board of Microsoft to dedicate more time to the philanthropic properties including global health and development, education, and my increasing engagement in tackling climate change. Co-founder Bill Gates is going to be stepping down from the company's board of directors. As the pandemic swept across the earth, Gates has been elevated to a status of supreme authority for the pandemic crisis, appearing all over mass media to share his views and recommendations. On March 18th, Bill Gates took part in an AMA, Ask Me Anything, on Reddit, titled, I'm Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Ask me anything about COVID-19. One question in particular produced an answer by Bill Gates that revealed a plan for a digital certificate to keep track of who got vaccinated. A Reddit user named Remote Controlled User asked this question. What changes are we going to have to make to how businesses operate to maintain our economy while providing social distancing? Bill Gates' answer? The question of which businesses should keep going is tricky. Certainly food supply and the health system. We still need water, electricity and the internet. Supply chains for critical things need to be maintained. Countries are still figuring out what to keep running. Eventually, we will have some digital certificates to show who has recovered or been tested recently or when we have a vaccine who has received it. While most of Gates' answers were received with praise, this one raised lots of eyebrows. The most upvoted reply highlights the similarities between Gates' solution and the mark of the beast in the Bible. Also it causes also all, it causes both all small and great, small and both great, rich and poor, rich and poor both, free and both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. 
Before I continue, let me mention that there is a debate among Christians and Bible scholars as to what the mark of the beast really is. Some believe it's technology such as a microchip that will grant you an identity within the beast system, allowing you to participate in basic societal functions like the right to buy and sell goods. Others believe the mark to be metaphorical and receiving the mark on your forehead is akin to following the counterfeit system of worship with your mind, while the mark on the right hand is analogous to indicating the false god you serve with your actions. Okay, so this idea of a digital certificate to store medical information, including vaccines received, is currently in the works as part of a massive project called ID2020, which is backed by the United Nations, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Microsoft. ID2020 is developing a digital identification system that will store a wealth of personal information and will transcend the barriers of national governments. The official website of ID2020 states that a global digital identity is necessary to keep track of refugees and idealist people in developing countries. Of course, people in developed countries will be ID'd as well. The website states, we need to get digital ID right. Unfortunately, current models of digital ID do not meet everyone's needs. They are generally archaic, insecure, lacking adequate privacy protection, and for over a billion people worldwide, unavailable. Everyone should have access to a digital ID that enables them to prove who they are across institutional and international borders and across time, while giving them control over how their personal information is collected, used, and shared. In an article published by ID2020 in 2018, vaccines are the perfect way to introduce digital identity to the world, especially infants. Appropriately titled, Immunization and Entry Point for Digital Identity, the article states, because immunization is conducted in infancy, providing children with a digital child health card could give them a unique portable digital identity early in life. And as children grow, their digital child health card can be used to access secondary services such as primary school or ease the process of obtaining alternative credentials. Effectively, the child health card becomes the first step in establishing a legal, broadly recognized identity. In order to enable digital identity at scale, we need to identify and leverage many entry points. Immunization service delivery presents a tremendous opportunity to provide children with a durable, portable, and secure digital identity early in life, enabling access to a wider range of social services while also improving access to the health interventions all children need and deserve. We're proud to partner with Gavi and excited to see the innovations proposed as part of the Infuse Challenge to all innovators, the deadline to apply for the program is April 10th, so please get those applications in. Infuse. It doesn't get any better than that. What's the definition of infuse? Number four here says, to administer or inject. So basically, according to ID2020, vaccinations are the perfect opportunity to introduce a digital ID that would store the medical history of each individual. This identity would also be used to grant access to basic rights and services. Another form of embedded vaccine identification that Bill Gates has been funding research on is the quantum dot tattoo. In December 2019, a group of researchers at MIT published a study in Science Translational Medicine about the use of quantum dot tattoos to identify people who received a vaccine. An article in Futurism titled, An Invisible Quantum Dot Tattoo Could Be Used to ID Vaccinated Kids, reviewed this study. For the people overseeing nationwide vaccination initiatives in developing countries, keeping track of who had which vaccinations and when can be a tough task. But researchers from MIT might have a solution. They've created an ink that can be safely embedded in the skin alongside the vaccine itself and it's only visible using a special smartphone camera app and filter. In other words, they've found a covert way to embed the record of a vaccination directly in the patient's skin rather than documenting it electronically or on paper, and their low-risk tracking system could greatly simplify the process of maintaining accurate vaccine records, especially on a larger scale. The invisible tattoo accompanying the vaccine is a pattern made up of minuscule quantum dots tiny semiconducting crystals that reflect light, that glow under infrared light, 
the pattern and vaccine gets delivered into the skin using high-tech dissolvable micro needles made of a mixture of polymers and sugar. It's possible someday that this invisible approach could create new possibilities for data storage, biosensing, and vaccine applications that could improve how medical care is provided, particularly in the developing world. Everything happening at the moment seems to be multifaceted, facilitating the advancement of many different agendas, namely the deliberate crashing of the economy and the expansion of power for the psychopathic elite. According to this article, former UK Prime Minister and key Bilderberg meeting attendee, Gordon Brown has called on the world leaders to form a temporary global government in response to the coronavirus pandemic. So obviously there's a push for a one world order. Nothing new there. But check this out. Earlier I briefly mentioned how the Rockefeller Foundation is a financial backer of Project ID 2020. The Rockefeller Foundation published a report called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. It's a scenario planning exercise that goes over hypothetical crisis situations and one of them is a global pandemic. One of the four narratives in the book is titled Lockstep, subtitled A World of Tighter Top-Down Government Control and More Authoritarian Leadership with Limited Innovation and Growing Citizen Pushback. I'm going to read some of this, but keep in mind that this was published in 2010, so obviously it was written in the same year or even earlier. But it starts off, In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's H1N1, this new influenza strain originating from wild geese was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic-prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just 7 months. The majority of them healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economies. International mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global supply chains. Even locally, Normally bustling shops and office buildings sat empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. The pandemic blanketed the planet. Though disproportionate numbers died in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official containment protocols. But even in developed countries, containment was a challenge. The United States, initial policy of strongly discouraging citizens from flying, proved deadly in its leniency accelerating the spread of the virus, not just within the U.S., but across borders. However, a few countries did fare better. China in particular, the Chinese government's quick imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as its instant and near-hermetic sealing off of all borders, saved millions of lives, stopping the spread of the virus far earlier than in other countries and enabling a swifter post-pandemic recovery. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions, from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entries to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. In order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems, from pandemics and transnational terrorism to environmental crises and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. Okay, I'll stop there. You get the point, I'm sure. This is near perfect in describing what's taking place right now. I'll link this PDF in the description for you guys. Another interesting book I found is called Microelectronics and Society. For better or for worse, a report to the Club of Rome. And this was published in 1982. It basically records the evolution of computer technology and has some very interesting things about the coming state of a cashless society. Let's read a couple parts. The concentration of activities around the computer will tend to immobilize the family, just as the TV does in many instances today, but much more so. This picture is the vision of the wired society, the cashless society, but not, we must hope, 
the alienated society, in which voting in elections and collective decision-making possibilities are available from the armchair at home, but not used. I thought that was wild to read from a book that was published in 1982. Also there's this. The unique characteristics of these systems make the application of existing consumer protection laws unclear, leaving the rights and liabilities of users undefined. Regulation E, Electronic Funds Transfer, 1980, of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System from which the above was quoted, was designed to react to that concern. With the advent of videotex terminals in the home and the generalization of such systems, the terms relating to transactions need to be explicit. The move to the cashless society seems inevitable, given the technological push provided by microelectronics and the significant cost advantages associated with the transfer of funds electronically. The Club of Rome is a powerful collection of international elites who claim to serve humanity as a premier environmental think tank and consultants to the United Nations. Here's a quote from a book written by the club's co-founder. The Club of Rome is part of the overall process taking place to fulfill the United Nations Agenda 2030. Formerly known as Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 is the draconian master plan adopted in 2015 that parades as a Save the World campaign when in fact it's the blueprint that brings about the implementation of the One World Order. If you look at this chart that I made here, you can see the goals as given by the United Nations and what the goals actually mean on the bottom. A few of these goals are definitely already accomplished, and it's just a matter of time before the rest are completed. I mean, we only have 10 years until 2030. They have the megacities mapped already on a website called America2050.org, along with the Trans-American Passenger Network to travel to and from these megacities. The cities are going to be laced with smart meters, smart poles, 5G, and whatever comes after, 6G, 7G, 8G. People are going to be tracked from the cradle to the grave with microchip implants that digitally store everything there is to know about them, including their finances and their ability to make transactions. That's why I tend to think that the microchip might be the mark of the beast. It says no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. People all over the world are doing experimental microchipping. Not to mention what's happening now with ID2020. We're also moving towards a cashless society with every day that passes. This pandemic is carrying multiple agendas forward. The push for centralized control of information, which is censorship and narrative control. The cashless agenda forming out of the economic crash taking place right now and the fear of passing germs through the use of physical money. Martial law quarantines. Mandatory vaccination and digital identification via microchipping. This situation is the biggest show of force and seizure of power that anyone alive today has ever seen in their lifetime. This is very serious. Life is not going back to normal ever again. It truly is the end of the world as we know it. We need to take a stand. Refuse forced vaccines. Destroy 5G technology any chance we get, and don't let them fill you up with fear. From what I gather, they lose in the end anyway. You know, I really hope that's true. And this life is only temporary, so don't be scared. Be strong and stand up for yourselves. I know one thing for sure, I'll die or be thrown in a FEMA camp, or worse, before going along with what they're doing right now. Maybe you should consider doing the same thing. This has been ODD. Never sleep again, my friends. Take care. So this is where the microchip implant story begins. You will be chipped. It's just a matter of time. A small firm recently embedded microchips in their employees as a way to bypass company badges and corporate logons. 
and to get attention for their cafeteria kiosks, which are available on a cashless payment plan like Apple Pay. The latest office innovation is a microchip implanted in the skin and designed to replace the traditional keypad for opening doors, using the copier, even buying food in the cafeteria. Employees at a vending company are going from the assembly line to front of the pack to get microchipped. Do you think this is the future? It is the future, and we look at this as uh, uh, being responsible. The implant, which has been FDA approved, is the size of a grain of rice and is injected under the skin between the thumb and index finger by a licensed piercer. I think it's the wave of the future that we'll all have implanted chips that have our medical records. So you would do it? Sure. Okay. Well, you're carrying around a phone anyway. This is a microchipping party. Hannah's getting an electronic chip implanted into her hand. So congratulations, Hannah. Thank you. You've been chipped? Yes, I have. How does it feel? It feels good. I'm, I'm excited to see what I'll be able to do now. Can I touch it? Yeah, you can, you can feel it there. I feel like this is the future. It's the next big thing that's going to happen. A tiny microchip like this inserted just beneath the skin in their hands. This technology will, one day, change the way we live. But in the future, we will all be chipped. In Sweden, the microchips are already here. The microchip implants use the same technology that's in contactless credit cards. Which have made cash pretty much obsolete in Sweden. No cash. Is a cashless society inevitable? How long will it take for a cash? Many countries are fast moving towards a cashless society. Between 2000 and 2015, non-cash payments in the U.S. grew by almost 400%. Venmo, the mobile app where people can pay each other on a smartphone, now processes $2 billion a month. This year, Apple added similar payment capabilities in iMessage. These free services are so popular, 30 major banks recently launched a competing product called Zelle. It would be better if we were more like Sweden, where cash has nearly been phased out, and the U.S. will get there, too, in another five or ten years. There's no question that cash, you know, is in its last era. China's cashless revolution has happened in just three years. In order to avoid the risk of transmission through physical handling of money, we encourage the use of cashless transactions such as mobile money, m and otherwise, and credit cards. Well, health experts say the coronavirus can live on surfaces like cash for up to 10 days. That has many people worried about shopping and other everyday tasks. The standard narrative in society is that cashlessness, quote-unquote cashlessness, is a sort of organic process just percolating from the bottom up by ordinary individual people who are just sort of making these organic decisions to switch to this other thing, right? Um, now this is pure, if you want to, like this, this is a, a, a pure, to put it crudely, capitalist ideology, corporate capitalist ideology, where essentially you always want to focus attention on the small person in society, quote unquote, the consumer, all right, the sort of like random person who wanders around in markets, who apparently controls what's going on in the world, all right? Of course, if you actually go and ask any person in society, how much agency do you believe that you had in the emergence of this technology, almost nobody believes they had anything to do with the emergence of the technology, all right? What actually happens is that large-scale institutions institutions push the stuff onto you for various commercial reasons and various other reasons. Um, and the, the large-scale institutions love to disguise themselves and just never talk about themselves as if they're just not there. All right. So it, what, it's the story about the war on cash is a, a, a bunch of us who are trying to say, actually, over the last few decades, a large-scale institutions, banks, payments companies, governments, have all been actively um, eroding the cash system to slowly make it more and more likely that you're going to quote-unquote choose uh, to go to the digital systems, okay? Now, you might believe that you're choosing this, um, but actually the whole environment is being structured in a way that makes you more and more likely to do it. The biblical entry point for any discussion of the one world economic system, a, a cashless society, an end time prophecy, is Revelation 13, 16 to 18. He causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. 
And he provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. The Bible clearly links the global mark of the beast system with the emergence of a cashless society. One world government, a new global economy ruled by one man is coming. The banking overlord is coming. And he'll have a solution that everyone will indeed, quote, bow down to, end quote, and he's called Antichrist. And he will have his mark. He will do this for increased control of commerce. It will be perfect and complete control. His economic policy is very simple. Take my mark and worship me or starve. No mark, no merchandise, no seal, no sale. So if you want to function in this new economy under this coming world leader, you have to take the mark. Just go quietly into the night There's forces of darkness at work And they're restricting the light I'm so fed up with the lies They tell us this isn't right It's ODDTV You best believe I'll get up and fight This is my plight I'll never let you cowards get the best of me Took the red pill Now it's time to fulfill my destiny Living like I'm Neo Dipping from my P.O.